Senator Jim Abler, as chair of the Human Services Reform Committee, has been fighting for ways to improve aid for those in need while making efficient use of taxpayer dollars. He joins me now to talk through some of the highlights and challenges of the state's next two year budget. Thanks for being here. Hey, we made it. We made it. We got to the end. The only divided legislature in the country. We finished pretty much just a little over time, and yeah. it's something to be proud of that Minnesota can make things work. And, and was able to compromise on important things, including health and human services. Honorably so, compromising. Honorably? <laughs> yes, you yes. pray it's honorable. Yes, honorably compromising. Uh, one of the key accomplishments of this budget, as um, Commissioner Tony Laurie, Laurie spoke about, is the increase of $100 a month for the poorest of the poor, those who receive the Minnesota Family Investment Program. Is this a good step forward? Well, it's just humane. It's been almost three decades since it's been increased. These uh, families get $435 a month. And, and it's a transitional program, I'm trying to move them into independence. And it's hard to become independent when you can't even afford rent. And so the $100 is a very good thing. We did something else on a related thing. It's a program called a spend down. So if you're low income and have a disability, you have to spend down of your limited resources to get into the Medicaid healthcare system that you really need because you have a disability. And so these people are paying two, three, four hundred dollars a month to get into very low, of their low money. And so we abolished that in 2022. This has been going on for all, also about three decades. And it's been very troubling. And it's a, these, these two together make it a really positive outcome. That's so the progress for, for those who are truly in need. Uh, there was a news report last summer that highlighted some fraud in the child care assistance program, which people around here refer to as CCAP. The legislative auditor followed up with recommendations. Did any of those recommendations make it into this next budget? Absolutely. It became a big deal. And it's not just since last summer. It's a decade ago and longer that we've been looking at eligibility and integrity parts of the program. And actually, people lie sometimes. And sometimes they're, they're just ignorant or naive, but sometimes they're actually fraudulent. And DHS found that 7% of the CCAP payments were fraudulent, which is a lot. And that means there's more than that. And so we made a big effort in the Senate to crack down on integrity. And I think that drew the governor and the department along to have more integrity. The bill is full of integrity. And so we were unwilling to add more money to child care until we were sure that the money that we're spending was well spent. The governor wanted to spend like $80 million more, and we said, no, no, uh, we're going to take care of people with disabilities and other things instead, but we'll work on integrity, and then we can talk about trying to uh, ex expand money. But actually, if you do the integrity part and eligibility, more people will get services because it's not being stolen, and the people who need it the most will get it. And so that was a very constructive outcome, and done in a collaborative way, and at the end, we all agreed. Well, and so then relatedly, there will be the formation of a Blue Ribbon Council that will look for waste and fraud in public programs. Uh, what do you think they'll find? And program efficiencies. We spend $37 billion every two years on the health and human services niche. That's a lot. The whole state budget is $48 billion now. And there, so part of that money comes from the feds. We spend half and they give us half. But $37 billion. If you found 5%, that's $2 billion. And so we're suggesting that they find a, a fraction of a, a, like a percent or something that they could do better. I'll, I'll give you a hint. If you have $37 billion of programming, you can find $100 million that you could better spend. And as we struggle to do that, um, it'll actually it'll help people believe in the programming more and so we can do more to serve the people with the greatest needs and, can, and have people work their way through to become independent and have the life that they want. None of the programs we have in our human services programs are places you want to spend your life on. You want to kind of get the help and move along. Some people really need it and you know, we want to serve them. But if you can be independent, especially like in disability programs and, and so on, let's go there. And it turns out that actually saves money, but it really saves people's lives and it saves workforce, which is a major issue. Um, they're not making enough people apparently and so we're, we're running low on people that are willing to serve in this this industry. Well, and that was a that was a next question that I had was, you know, the state has this overall challenge, as many parts of the country do, of simply having enough workers. But the population that cares for those in need and the elderly, which is a growing population, uh, whether personal care, assisted living, nursing homes, 
are we finding enough workers? How can we find enough workers? How can we pay them a decent wage? Well, that's the problem. We tried to address that in the Senate this year. It turns out within six years, we'll be short 40% of the PCA hours. 40%. That means you're awarded 10, you get six. It means you, have, you, need, you need 10 workers, you have six. I mean, it's like, holy cow. And so at some point, we have to decide who do we really, who, who can we serve? Who can we realistically fit into the lifeboat? Not even about the money. This isn't even a money issue. This is about enough human beings in the state to do the work. And so we discussed at a great length to raise the acuity of people we choose to serve and find some alternate ways that are maybe less uh, substantial to help people with what they might need. And then move them to independence, which also requires less work. And so that's an ongoing challenge. We'll tackle that again next year. Uh, let's return to child care just for a moment because there is a shortage of child care providers, especially in greater Minnesota. Is there anything in this next uh, two-year budget that's going to help alleviate that need for child care? Well, and so there's the centers, but they're mostly metro. When you get out to greater Minnesota, it's licensed homes, and they are getting pummeled with regulations and foolish oversight that doesn't change anything that doesn't make a child safer. Safety is everything. But the providers actually have to work at this. And these are people working 10, 12 hour days. Um, and we tried really hard to take some pressure off of them. And this is one area we did not agree on. We cracked it a little bit, but um, uh, we're going to keep pushing the governor and uh, the commissioner. But they need to, to let off the oversight in some ways. And there's things called fix-it tickets. If you have some unflushed toilets, they can give you a citation for that. Or you could just go flush the toilet. You ever see a little kid not flush the toilet? Could happen. <laughs> or there's some debris in the yard. Um, that's a citable thing. And so now on the website, they had three citations. Two unflushed toilets and some debris in the yard. Really? And so, and, and they used the wrong water bottle for some kid. Like, holy cow, those are not like life safety things. And let's take the pressure off of those. Let's make sure that there's no dangerous things that the people are well background checked so that no predators get in the business so that parents can leave their child off and feel safe. So we have more work to do, but I was really disappointed that we could not come to an agreement on that. And I, I anyway, this is too bad. More, more, work, more work on that topic. Uh, one more question. There have been dueling opinion pieces about the failure of the Alec Smith Emergency Insulin Act to become law this session. Uh, you and several members of your caucus have asked the governor to call a special session. Uh, to address the problem of people in emergency situations who need insulin, life-saving insulin. What are you proposing? Well, and I think part of this was just because there was so much material jammed into the end, and then things went offline. And I think if more of this could have been public, we could have sorted our way through this, because there's a strong interest in making sure that no one else uh, dies for lack of insulin. And these are he was a 26-year-old, aged off his parents' insurance, couldn't afford the $1,300 because of his high deductible if he even bought insurance. Um, and so that should never happen in Minnesota. And, and so we proposed that you would actually uh, use some existing mechanisms in the uh, state programs to, uh, to reach out and make a difference about that. There's a strong interest on this in a bipartisan way. And I think at the end we can sort something out. And um, focusing on the needs and saving lives and uh, that provokes us a lot, and I, I think that well, something will come of it at least by next year, if not sooner. Senator Abler, we have to stop there, but thank you. Oh, yeah, thanks. Happy summer.